Let's get into it here with rest of season top 150 thoughts. I think we could play a game because, my gosh, a lot of panic out there after week one. It feels like maybe more panic than usual after week one. People are freaking out. And part of that was it was a very low scoring week one. It was very run centric week one. A lot of the stuff was down in terms of wide receiver stuff, quarterback stuff, tight end stuff. Also, what was down was this Christian McCaffrey situation. Let's play some panic and chill. I'll start with you, Mark. Panic or chill on Christian McCaffrey. You can see here we have dropped him down to number five overall in the ranks. And that assumes that he's going to play in week two or week three, dealing with calf and Achilles tendonitis. In general, I'd, I'd lean chill here. Um, certainly a, a little bit more of the panic can come in. If you, you know, obviously since it was Monday night football, most teams probably didn't have a replacement for Christian McCaffrey. So I'd imagine uh, a lot of teams lost their week one matchup like Jack Leone and myself did in a, in a main event. We had Christian McCaffrey needed 10 points and he did not play. So we lost that matchup. Uh, pretty brutal way to go out. But in general here, I think chill just because uh, it seems like even if Christian McCaffrey does miss week two, it's not necessarily a long term injury and um you know hopefully we can make it through the regular season and christian mccaffrey smashes in the fantasy playoffs uh certainly if this extends past week two or week three that's when i'd start to panic but for now i lean more on the chill side of christian mccaffrey yeah so my concern jack is that jordan mason looked really good christian mccaffrey is 28 with achilles tendonitis that extreme workhorse role that we've seen from mccaffrey the last two years where let's say he's playing 90% of the snaps and handling 95% of the running back touches, do the 49ers say, oh, gosh, maybe we should take it a little bit easy here and go to some mix of McCaffrey and Mason? I don't think that's the base case, but that's at least crept into my mind a little bit. Jack, we do have Jordan Mason firmly in the top 150 now at 103 overall. Any thoughts on Mason and that stuff, Jack? Yeah, I think that's pretty baked into where we have McCaffrey. I mean, we have him fifth, I think, before the season he was clear cut number one I think that there's room for McCaffrey's workload to go down and him still to be a top tier running back I mean Jordan Mason is out there for the vast majority of uh, I mean pretty much everything he played pass downs too and he he only had one target I think whereas McCaffrey is a a lock for 15 to 20 percent target share projection every time he plays I also think McCaffrey would still be the guy near the goal line uh, when he's out there so even if they take some of the load off McCaffrey via Mason um I I would expect that to be lower leverage touches um and McCaffrey can still be a a top five player in fantasy pretty easily even if even if they're involving RB2 more than they were last year sure and and I think that's a totally fair point clearly Jameer Gibbs is not handling every touch we have him 12th Devon Achan is not handling every touch we have him 16th you keep going on down the list with guys who are in timeshares, but still really valuable. And yeah, the efficiency on Christian McCaffrey, I was real tempted. I didn't want to do it because I didn't feel like fighting on Twitter, but I was real tempted to go with the 90% CMC (laughs) meme on Jordan Mason uh, the other night. Uh, The longtime listeners will remember that from the Mike Davis days when he was smashing as Christian McCaffrey's backup in Carolina. All right, Daigle, let's go to some of this tight end stuff. I know a lot of people out there are like, every elite tight end failed. This was such a bad strategy. I should have just punted tight end. I didn't want any of these guys. I I wouldn't take it as like a holistic thing. At first, I would say we need to take these guys on a case-by-case basis. The second thing that I would say is in a week where passing was down, passing touchdowns were down so much, I don't want a full-blown panic right now. A lot of tight end scoring is going to be tied to touchdowns. And so when passing touchdowns are down massively, which I thought was kind of a fluke, when passing touchdowns are down massively, it's not going to look great. I want to start with the Mark Andrews thing. Daigle, I think he was a guy that you were higher on before the season. How do you feel now? Silva and I talked about it a bunch yesterday. I want to be clear. Mark Andrews did run more routes on Isaiah Likely in that game. Mark Andrews has also failed over and over again against Steve Spagnuolo's defenses with the Chiefs. So I'm certainly not full-blown panicked on Mark Andrews, but I always kind of thought that Kincaid and McBride, who also failed in week one, we're better than him. Anyways, Daigle, where are you at on Mark Andrews? We have dropped him down to 59 overall in the top 150 right now. 
I'm going to back up for a second and just remind everyone that even last year, what's happened is since the final cut down day got moved to literally the week before the season, as opposed to slowly chopping players to make their active 53 man roster. And we've reduced the preseason by one game that leads to slower play and poor performances to start the year. Even last week, it was a couple weeks because offenses just have to have to get these reps and uh, the throws and the runs under their belt. Just look at Marvin Harris. Harrison Jr. We were drafting Marvin Harrison Jr. in the second round. Obviously, what he put on film looked poor. I think it's truly just because that's a player who had little reps this offseason and no reps during preseason games. It's it's simple. So for someone like Mark Andrews, I do just look at what we discussed in the waiver pod as well and picking up Isaiah Likely and that we definitely need to temper our expectations because like Andrews' ceiling outcome now, there is another player at his same position that's competing it for that target share. So that doesn't mean that both can't get there, but I also now question Andrew's ceiling, which is why we bumped him back a bit. He can definitely still get there. As you said, he ran more routes, and historically he had been completely shut down by Spags in the five career games they played each other. But I still want to bet on someone in that offense, especially since they have no wide receiver too. So clearly still in on both Andrews and Likely. And this is not the waiver wire show, but for Likely... It really just comes down to who your other tight end is. You don't have to get into the bidding war. If you have a Jake Ferguson, David Njoku, you can instead just save a couple bucks and pick up Colby Parkinson since you're really looking at a low-end tight end one anyhow. But if you don't have a tight end, you should just take a chance on likely ceiling and buy that. Yeah. Uh, David Njoku, I'm worried about. Like this ankle thing seems bad. Already been ruled out for week two. Mm -hmm. So I would actually be worried if I had David Njoku. But yeah, uh, that I that's fine. My, I, I think... My concern is that Lamar Jackson threw it 41 times in that game. How many 41 attempt Lamar Jackson games are we going to get? So I actually like the way we have it here with Kincaid, Pitts, uh, ahead of Mark Andrews in the top 150. And it was only the second time that Jackson had reached 40 plus attempts and 20 career games under Todd Munkin. It just doesn't happen. Yeah. Right, exactly. All right. I do think that it's worth going case by case. Let me use other tight ends, Mark. I'll, I'll start with Trey McBride, who actually got a bump in our rankings, despite a relatively poor box score, did soak up a bunch of targets against the Cardinals, um, uh, against the Bills. I would, maybe we should talk about this in conjunction with Marvin Harrison. Daigle already mentioned Marvin Harrison. A lot of panic out there. If you go on Twitter, uh, I could beat Marvin Harrison in a 40-yard dash, according <laughs> to Twitter uh, right now. So, Mark, what do you think about the Arizona stuff? We did move McBride up decently, and we did move Marvin Harrison down decently. Yeah, I think with McBride, it does stem from a little concern around Marvin Harrison. We docked him and McBride, you know, naturally the next best pass catcher in that offense. So bumped him up a little bit and his usage was elite in week one, ran uh, nearly 90% of the routes, had a 30% target share for McBride. So I think the case there is, is strong on him. Obviously, the box score didn't necessarily reflect with a, a five catch 30 yard performance, uh, but we saw kind of the thesis play out for this Cardinals team in week one that they're they're likely going to be involved in plenty of shootouts this season and i think trey mcbride is going to be at the focal point of this passing game continually so you know in week one obviously a lot of our priors are shattered but some are confirmed and i think with mcbride here we feel even better about him being a, a top tier tight end and potentially a tight end one or two the rest of the season uh so we did bump him up a little bit there as well and uh certainly him him climbing the ranks is just because some players ahead of him fell back, necess uh, you know, not necessarily him leaping ahead, but some players certainly falling yeah. behind due to injury, role, et cetera. Okay. I think this Marvin Harrison one is a big one. Uh, you know, I was concerned before this season that it's very expensive for a rookie wide receiver, period. I just love the setup for Arizona so much. I thought they would be the premier shootout team in the NFL this year. All the tape bros, all the stats bros, everybody said Marvin Harrison is one of the best prospects, wide receiver prospects ever. If you look at the data from wide receivers selected that high in the draft, it is very strong. However, it's a small sample. There are not that many wide receivers that go in the top 10. So I, I get why people are panicked on Marvin Harrison because like you had that feeling. A lot of people, including myself, had that feeling in the back of their, their stomach like, man, are we really going to spend a round two pick on a rookie wide receiver here we have not seen him do it at the nfl level it's not like the running back position where guys can just come in and start smashing right away so easily so jack we have 
bumped Marvin Harrison down significantly here? Should people be panicked? And for the audio listeners, 32 overall we're at on Marvin Harrison right now. I wouldn't say you should be panicked. Uh, I do think you should be worried, um, especially relative to the price you paid to get him in your draft in all likelihood. Like I, I do think that like you don't like you were drafting him next to guys like AJ Brown, Garrett Wilson, in all likelihood, and you simply don't see those guys have the type of performance that Marvin Harrison Jr. has. With that being said, we still have him uh, in, in roughly the third round. Um, if you were redrafting today, I, I think that's a pretty fair price. We know that rookie wide receivers tend to improve throughout the season. I think that for Marvin Harrison, that's something that we should expect. I wouldn't be surprised if by the end of the season he is a top 10 overall fantasy player. Um, Jonathan Gannon said after the game, he credited the Bills defense. He said they were really clouding him. Um, there are those cut-ups online of Harrison, though, failing to get open. Um, so I don't think it was purely the Bills defense. I do think it partially lies on Harrison as well. Um, so, yeah, I think Harrison is still a fantasy starter. But I do think that we're going to need uh, see an actual ascent for Harrison as opposed to someone who comes in and immediately smashes as a, a fantasy wide receiver one, like some were yeah. expecting. Well, I think some people are going to say, listen, maybe we should be buying low on Marvin Harrison. I can kind of get behind that depending on what the price is. They play home against the Rams, home against the Lions, home against the Commanders next three games. I mean, that's a really clean setup for Marvin Harrison Jr. coming through here. Dago, what do you think about trying to buy in the trade market on Marvin Harrison or should we just leave it alone? Oddly enough, it's the Isaiah Likely conversation in, are you going to be out there? Are you going to be running routes? That's what we're trying to see. Because if you are, we think you can earn targets. And you just had listed a schedule, short term, go beyond that. The 49ers, they'll probably have to pass the ball. The Packers most likely with Jordan Love back in a month. Uh, the Dolphins also coming up. Maybe the Bears figure it out. To me, the next two months for the Cardinals are, especially with that defense, literally doing nothing but playing three wide sets. So Marv will be out there. I am someone who was pushing on our late night call last week or last night over wings and pizza to get the Cardinals up because I just want to buy on the opportunity against this horrific defense that no one's arriving to help out. Sure. Um, I think we know he's going to be out there, right? That's not what I'm worried about. He's, if he can't earn targets though, quickly, Trey McBride and Greg Dorch are target earners, both of them, you know, I mean, both those guys historically earn targets really well. So I, I don't know that we're going to see 11, 12, 13 target games from Marvin Harrison. Again, in the trade market, you know, once the in-season trade calculator is up, you'll be able to see it clear. But if people are selling too low on Marvin Harrison, I think I'd at least consider buying. Mark, any final thoughts on Marvin Harrison before we move on? I think it comes down to if if we think Marvin Harrison Jr. just sucks after one week. Like, is that is that what we've come to after being the overall top wide receiver prospect? I'm yeah. I'm not necessarily right. buying it. I think I think it's just a rough week one. I think he's gonna round into form. You know, ideally at home in the dome, he'll look a lot faster, cleaner. Like, I, I think Daigle's right that probably just lack of reps, lack of NFL speed. I, I think he's going to get there. Um, certainly, I, I think just given where he was getting drafted and having the one catch four yard performance that, that he probably shouldn't have been drafted at that point if that's in the range of outcomes. Uh, so it's, you know, I, I'm, I'm certainly not panicking, but it's not not ideal start. Okay, I'm going to take the Don Kincaid situation myself because I am holding a massive Don Kincaid <laughs> bag. Uh, right now. So I was actually encouraged because everybody's like, oh my God, uh, Dawson Knox is going to come in there and they're going to share the routes. That is not, that was not the case. Don, Don Kincaid was out there on, I believe it was 25 out of 30, ran around on 25 out of 30 dropbacks in that game. That is really strong usage for a tight end. I am concerned that Josh Allen is just going to spread the ball around all year. Now, I thought that would be the case at wide receiver. But I did think that Don Kincaid would be the premier target earner there. So yeah, I certainly have some concerns that he just immediately against a really bad defense was unable to earn targets. But I was still encouraged by the usage on Don Kincaid. It is concerning that like the way the Bills have won late last year and the way the Bills won in week one is run the ball. I mean, negative PROE tons of James Cook. And then when they get around the goal line, it's just Josh Allen, Superman, right? Oh, we're, we're six yards out. No problem. Josh running in. Oh, we're 10 yards out. No problem. Josh running in. And he does these Superman things. So yeah, I would say it wasn't an ideal week one for Don Kincaid. Um, I would be, mm, I guess I'm a hold on Don Kincaid. I, I wouldn't be buy or sell right now for me on Don Kincaid. That's my personal take of someone holding 
an uncomfortable amount of Don Kincaid bags. Jack, any more thoughts on Kincaid that I may have missed? I'm with you on Kincaid. Um, I think if someone is is selling low, I would probably be buying. Okay. Uh, any other tight ends, Daigle, you want to touch on? Kelsey failed, which was good for me personally. Um, George Kittle didn't do great. Kyle Pitts was lucky to score a touchdown. Any other tight end thoughts here, Daigle, before we move on? Oh, Pitts was lucky to score the touchdown, sure. But we still got three of his four targets within nine yards of the line of scrimmage, which again, we did not get at all last year or for his career since he was the only tight end with a 12 yard depth of target for three seasons under Arthur Smith. I think we did get a little more manufactured usage plus being the only tight end in the entire league who ran around on literally every drop back. So we're crossing our fingers that Kirk Cousins works out. We'll find out more on Monday night, but even if Michael Penix Jr. is under center, I think Pitts' usage is still something I'm buying. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's go to one of the biggest stories of the week. Sylvan and I spent a bunch of time on it yesterday, but it is this J.K. Dobbins situation. So to be clear, J.K. Dobbins comes out, looks awesome. I didn't think he looked 100%, but he still looked like he knew exactly where to go, and he was still really explosive and jump cutting all around. At this point, the bet, I mean, the bet for me has always been, this. it won't last, right? You cannot have multiple ligament tears in your knee and an Achilles tear and sustain this kind of workload and production for the entire season. We are up to 94 overall on J.K. Dobbins. I'm sure, Mark, people are going to say that's too low. This is an elite offensive line. This is an offensive scheme that wants to run the ball and is going to do it well as Greg Roman has every single place that he's been. And J.K. Dobbins looks like a star out there. Again, you know, my bet is that come November, December, it's not going to be like that for J.K. Dobbins. He's not going to be this effective and be able to maintain this workload. But man, that's a scary take right now because the guy is really likely to smash when he's healthy, gets the Panthers this week. My God, Mark, what do you think on this J.K. Dobbins rank? Again, we're 94 overall right now. I, th- I think the Chargers showed us a little something in week one, honestly, on how how they plan to use J.K. Dobbins and not necessarily overload him with touches because he was clearly outplaying Gus Edwards the entire game, yet Gus continued to play more snaps and ended up with more actual touches uh, than, than J.K. Dobbins. So I do think they're cognizant of the fact they don't want to overload Dobbins too early and overwork him. Uh, so I don't necessarily think he's just going to jump up to like the 15 to 20 touch range here immediately. And in that case, he's going to have to maintain his efficiency to keep up kind of that RB2 uh, role that he had. I do think, honestly, that the more bullish aspect of J.K. Dobbins usage in week one was how involved he was in the past game. He ran 17 routes and had three targets from Justin Herbert. And I think that's going to be a, a legitimate upgrade from his time with Lamar Jackson in Baltimore. So I do think Dobbins is is solidly in kind of the RB2 range at this point. Sure, we may be a little low overall on him in, in the week one ranks. But again, this is this is taking into the, the rest of the season, you know, outlook. And, and I don't necessarily think that his injury issues are fully behind him after just one good game. So um, certainly a win in week one for J.K. Dobbins truthers. And, uh, you know, hope hope that he stays healthy and, and continues this role for him personally. But uh, again, I, I do have some doubts about him staying healthy. And I think that's that's baked in uh, to our ranking here currently. Yeah. If you watch some of those runs, he gets like caught from behind and he looks like he's like running kind of awkwardly I didn't even want to tweet it and make a thing about it though because he's just so effective anyways it's like okay well maybe maybe he's not as fast as he once was I know he hit a real high top end speed but he got caught from behind you know a couple times and it looks like he's like galloping I don't even know what it looks like he looks like something is off but it doesn't matter you know it, it doesn't matter that said Gus Edwards looks like he's dusted you know and it was only one game but Gus has looked really bad which is certainly a good thing for J.K. Dobbins, but yeah, agree with Mark that they that the Chargers should be at least aware. We don't even have Gus Edwards in the top 150, which I think is right. No. We, uh, it, it, um, the coaching staff is aware that they can't start going to 20 touches on J.K. Dobbins and expect him to sustain. All right. Part of the thing that makes resting top 150 so hard is injuries and timelines and all that. Let's go to Green Bay, Jack, where they have lost Jordan Love for, I don't know, two, three, four weeks would be my guess at this point. I wouldn't want to be starting, I don't think, any Packers wide receivers 
with Malik Willis. I, I mean, I can't believe the Packers left themselves in this situation. However, for rest of season top 150, maybe there's some opportunity here. Jack, how do you think about handling Packers wide receivers right now? Yeah, I think as long as love remains out, none of the Packers receivers are startable. Willis has, on a, on a limited sample of pass attempts, he has 5.2 yards per attempt and we know that they're going to be a lot run heavier with Willis at quarterback um a lot of their dropbacks will turn into scrambles with Willis at quarterback higher sack rate too I mean we saw at the end of um the game against the Eagles that Willis couldn't even get the Hail Mary off so I I just think for the next month it's going to be really rough sledding for all the Packers receivers whether or not you should buy them low kind of depends on your team construction if you think you are built to sit with Jaden Reed on your bench for the next four weeks um, and, and still win games and put yourself in a position to make the fantasy playoffs. I think that would make sense. Um, but if you're the team who really needs production now, maybe you even look to sell Reed or, or Watson or Dobbs or, or some of these guys for someone who can't contribute um, if you're really hurting a wide receiver already. Yeah, and so for the audio listeners, we have Jaden Reed 76 overall, Christian Watson 96, Romeo Dobbs 121, Wicks 148. I think people need to understand that Yes, the season has started, but we're still looking for back-weighted production. You just have to understand your team type, like what Jack said. If you have a really good team, a really deep team, I'd consider trading for Jaden Reed right now because I think Jordan Love will be back. At the quarterback position, you can play with MCL sprains and stuff like that. So I, I think buying on Jaden Reed, if you have a really good team, is an interesting one to consider. I, I will say, I, I think Jaden Reed is probably the only one I would consider starting until Jordan Love comes back just because we've seen him get the balls on these end arounds they're likely going to throw some screens to him he's just been so electric with the ball in his hands that I do think in in terms of just you know not necessarily pure downfield passing attack like I think Jaden Reed might be able to sustain some sort of fantasy relevance but I agree the other the other wide receiver is not necessarily startable there all right Daigle let's go to this Travis Etienne situation so it was a unideal week one for Travis Etienne Fumble out of the back of the end zone was just an absolute backbreaker for the team. And coupled with that, Tank Bigsby looked really good. Now, Doug Peterson, I think it was Doug Peterson, came out today and said, we're going to go back to Travis Etienne. Only way to get back into it is to get back on the horse, yada, yada, yada. That's what you say when you're a good coach and you're a leader and you say, you know, we believe in it. We're going to go right back to it. Do you buy that, Dago? We have moved Travis Etienne down to 47 overall, and we have moved tank Bigsby up to 116 overall so the gap there is getting quite tight for people who took Travis Etienne in round two or round three as noted in the waiver column it was a timeshare from kickoff Etienne 12 touches until that fumble at the goal line Bigsby had seven right behind him and it's as you mentioned Bigsby looked amazing whereas last year no one was touching the ball around etn that's how he got there 22 and a half touches per game in the first half of the season scored touchdowns then but then he got burnt out in the second half which is why peterson went throughout the offseason and said we have to keep someone involved to keep etn fresh so i don't think it's necessarily something like a jaleel mclaughlin and javante williams where i, I really do think mclaughlin just went in and out right i think it will be a timeshare but even a timeshare is absolutely concerning for ETN's rest of season value. And so we tried to bake that in here. Yeah, agreed. And, you know, just from a macro perspective from drafting, this is why, like, early round, I try to lean wide receiver, ideally, because, like, God, it's already, it's been one week, and a guy is already, like, lost his grip on the job. I mean, Zemir White had the grip on the job all, it takes one week for Alexander Madison to sneak in there. It takes one week for Tank Bigsby to sneak in there. You're not going to see, like, Devonta Smith or Mike Evans, like, you know, has some some geek off the street come in and take their job. So yeah, you know, I I would not be buying on ETN. I, I agree with Daigle. I I would not be buying on ETN. I think they want to give uh, Travis ETN some breaks at a minimum, if not full blown timeshare. Mark, the Cincinnati Bengals situation, man. Oh. There is video out there. I, there's somebody is sent a video of. They were like, Joe Burrow can't even hold a water bottle or something. But then I watched the video and it looked like he was holding the water bottle fine. So I don't know what they were talking about. Anyways, it didn't look good though. He was flexing his wrist. He dropped his eyes a bunch. T Higgins wasn't out there. We're still at six overall on Jamar Chase, whose role was really good. 70 overall on T Higgins, down to 88 overall though on Joe Burrow. It was a concerning week one. One thing that I would say about this though, 
I think, and I talked about this with Silva, I probably underestimated New England defense. Like those dudes can play. And I think New England defense is probably going to be a problem for opposing offenses all year. Mark, where you at on all this Burrow, T. Higgins, Bengals stuff? Loyal, rest of season top 150 listeners will remember last year I went full bone panic mode on this Bengals offense uh, when we were dealing with the Joe Burrow calf issue through the first week and first few weeks, and that turned out to be okay. So I'm, I'm trying to be calmer about it this season. Uh, we did drop T. Higgins quite a bit in the rest of the season rankings due to his hamstring issue. It, it, it looks like he will not play week two. I wouldn't be shocked if he even missed week three here as well. So uh, certainly a brutal start there for T Higgins. And, and I think uh, that that equates to our Joe Burrow drop as well. You know, part of the appeal to Joe Burrow is obviously he's going to dissect the defense from the pocket with T Higgins and Jamar Chase out there. And uh, without one of those guys, you know, that certainly hurts his fantasy upside. So here in general, I expect a good game from Jamar Chase against the Chiefs. I would expect them to load him up uh, with targets, especially but I also, you know, it's just consistent that the Bengals have started off slow in September. I, I, I'm not, you know, a, a genius that can tell you exactly why that's the case, but it's just been a trend uh, with Joe Burrow and this Zach Taylor offense over the years. So I'm definitely not panicked about it. Is it the start we wanted? Absolutely not. Um, I have a ton of T Higgins, especially. So um, I'm definitely, you know, concerned there, but Overall, with this Bengals offense, you know, I expect it to get a lot better and, and for them to figure things out. So certainly a rocky start, but not, not panicking at this point. Yeah. And the point on slow starts is well taken. I don't have the data in front of me, but it is clear. Joe Burrow has been a notorious slow starter throughout his career. The wrist stuff it adds a little bit more volatility in here, man, because it does scare me uh, a little bit there on that. They were extremely pass heavy, though, in that game. You know, it was relatively neutral script, and they were very, very pass-heavy, were the Bengals there. Uh, let's go to, you know what? Let's go to this Puka Nakua, Cooper Cup situation. Honestly, like, I know we probably can't do it, but I'd consider taking Cooper Cup even higher than we have him, and we've moved him up to 11 overall. Cooper Cup is going to get 30% of the targets from the wide receiver kingmaker, Matthew Stafford going forward. I don't see how Cooper Cup fails unless he gets hurt, period. So, you know, we have him right there with Garrett Wilson, A.J. Brown, Amon Ross St. Brown, Justin Jefferson. I'm not saying that we can responsibly move him up, but in my gut, I just want to be like, God, give me more, give me more, give me more Cooper Cup. Now, we do not know the exact timeline on Puka Nakua here, which makes things quite difficult. He's going to be out at least four games. These PCL things are scary. Guys have tried to play through them guys like Kyle Pitts and looked horrible out there trying to do so. Jack, what do you think about Cup and Puka stuff right now? And then I guess you could throw Demarcus Robinson, Tyler Johnson into list, although Daigle and I covered that pretty thoroughly on the waiver show. Yeah, I'm with you on Cup. I mean, we have seen him. I mean, based on our projections for week two, 30% target share is, is going to be low on Cup. He could be even higher than that. Um, and we have seen him put up like a legendary wide receiver season. And it seems like he's basically in the same situation as he was then just probably heightened injury risk uh, compared to, compared to that year. So, yeah, I, I think there's a pretty good argument for cup as a top, probably the top wide receiver in week two, given the matchup. Um, I think week to week, it's going to fluctuate with CD Tyreek, the other top guys, but based on matchup, but I think as long as cup stays healthy, it's fine to put him in that conversation. Um, with that being said, I do think that from a season-long perspective, Cup has significantly more risk, both with his age, his injury history, um, and then as well as Stafford's getting up there in age and has an injury history too. So it's a little more fragile um, than Lamb, Tyreek, Jamar, uh, once he gets the contract stuff figured out. Um, but in the short term, at least, I, I definitely think he's in that top tier of wide receiver. Yeah. Daigle, any thoughts on the Puka Nakua situation? Once again, we've dropped him down. To 40 something overall. I, I mean, you know, I, I don't think I'd be, uh, I'm sorry, we're dropping down to 51 overall. I, I don't think I'd necessarily be buying here unless someone was selling really cheap, but I also don't want to give up as long as I have some reasonable bench. It's just a bad situation, man. What do you think on the Puka stuff, Daigle? And I know Silva mentioned on the pod that he would drop him. I am not there. Hopefully you have an IR slot. It's rough though, genuinely, because we don't know the timeline beyond these 
four guaranteed games he'll miss. I'm also coming at the Rams from a little bit of a different angle, as I touched on with you as well at the waivers pod. It's just that even this week against the Cardinals, I believe the Rams are only going to have one available starting offensive lineman. We're yeah. already on backups. And that's why like in the alt markets this offseason, the Rams and the Jets took heavy alt unders and overs because they're elite old players with house of card contracts. Like when they fall apart, they fall apart hard as we already saw with the jets on Monday night football. So I'm a little bit more worried about the Rams offense long-term than everyone else. It seems Cooper mm-hmm. cup, totally fine. We're talking season long. You get yeah. hammered double digit targets. Who cares? Throws them out, throw them out there. But we have seen them with the John Wolfers of the world before. And it's not great. Right. Agreed. No, I mean, Stafford's the kingmaker, man. I mean, if Cup wasn't, I, I don't want to say it, actually. People people are going to go nuts if I say <laughs> it, but anyways. Um, okay. Um, oh, Mark, I want to ask about a couple guys. We didn't have these guys on the list, but Drake London and Chris Olave. We have them back-to-back in the ranks now. Drake London is down pretty significantly down to 19 overall. That's like roughly where he was getting drafted, maybe a little bit behind that. Olave were at 21st overall. I will note that Drake London ran 100% of the routes in that game. Also positive for Chris Olave. Saints went nuts on motion and play action, which is certainly good for Chris Olave. It's just everyone on the Saints went went crazy except for Olave. And so people are in a panic. So yeah, Mark, thoughts on London and Olave here. I love the setup for Olave and and also Rashid Shahid, honestly. Uh the Saints yeah. wide receivers, like the 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 wide receiver three is Cedric Wilson. Wide receiver four was Mason Tipton in week one. Uh, you know, Shahid and, and Chris Olave are going to get all the targets they can handle in, in actual meaningful matchups. And in the motion that we saw from Clint Kubiak in week one, I, I just think is extremely bullish on the Saints offense in general. So I, I think things are going to be extremely concentrated moving forward in, this, in the Saints offense. We obviously didn't see that week one, but I'm definitely buying on Chris Olave and, and Rashid Shahid as well lumped in there. In terms of Drake London, uh, we, we definitely dropped him, I, I think mostly just because of the Kirk Cousins you know, Achilles scare and how that Atlanta offense operated in week one. I'm, I, I don't know necessarily how to feel about that yet. It certainly was pretty horrible week one, but I think that was, you know, a lot of influences going into that, into that, um, production rather than, than, uh, you know, just a, a Kirk being completely dusted coming off that Achilles tear. So I think things will get better for London. You mentioned hundred percent route rate. I do think he'll get more targets moving forward when not faced up against, you know, a solid corner like Joey Porter Jr. So I I think things are still fine for Drake London, but certainly my enthusiasm and excitement about the Falcons offense is is hanging in the balance until we see some better, you know, at at least outlook on on Kirk Cousins or or a different offensive scheme where they're using play action at least. But um, if that doesn't get any better, then then I could see panicking on London and and the rest of the Falcons offense. I'm I'm so on the good side, Joey Porter Junior is a boss. I mean, he, and he's a great matchup for Drake London. Like that's one of the more difficult matchups I think that Drake London will see all season. On the bad side of it for Drake London, Kirk Cousins needs to be under center, needs to run play action. I mean, th- that's what he's good at. And instead, he couldn't take a snap from under center. He was in shotgun for all but one snap. And so that that's scary to me. On Olave, I mean, they scored 40 points and the guy had like two catches for 11 yards. I get why people are tilted. I'm, I'm tilted too. Believe me, but yeah, I think the Saints offense as a whole being good will be good for Alave. So yeah, I like where we have Alave there. All right. I, I will say with the Falcons too, just you know, new quarterback there, new offensive coordinator, completely new system. They did not play together in the preseason. Like I, I think I think, you know, expecting a ramp up period there is fair for them. It, it definitely looked bad in week one, but I think we should give them some leniency. Okay. Uh, a couple of running back spots wanted to mention first. Jerome Ford got a backdoor garbage time uh, touchdown to make him look reasonable. No new word on Nick Chubb lately, though, but Jerome Ford did get a big boost here. Jack, thoughts on Jerome Ford, who's now up to 81 overall in the rest of season top 150? Yeah, I mean, it's honestly kind of the same as the Falcons for Jerome Ford. Um, Deshaun Watson looked terrible, um, looked like he's completely cooked with the shoulder injury. But Ford's usage was really strong. Uh, Dante Foreman played one snap. I I think a lot of people, um, including us, really expected him to be the primary short yardage and goal line back. I think if he played one snap, we can pretty much rule that out. It looks like Pierre Strong is going to be the RB2 behind Jerome Ford. Uh, Ford was playing snaps inside 
the 10 yard line too, which I think bodes well for his chances of getting goal line work. He's, he remains the clear pass catching back. Um, and he had pretty much a monopoly on, on carries too. So I, I think the usage was really bullish for Jerome Ford. I think in the short term, simply based on volume, he's a fantasy starter. I'm, I'm super worried about Watson and the Browns, um, the Browns offense as a whole, as long as Watson remains the starter. But I think volume wise, Ford is a good bet to get a legitimate like RB1 level workload um, for the next uh, until Chubb returns, basically. Yeah. Yeah. And even when Nick Chubb returns, I mean, it's hard if and when Nick Chubb returns, it's hard to see him getting up towards 20 touches and Jerome Ford's still going to play on the pass downs in that situation. Obviously, it'll ding Jerome Ford, but I don't think maybe not as bad as some people think. The other running back we should mention, Daigle, is Tony Pollard, who moved up to 77 overall. The touch count was pretty wide, at least in terms of carries. Brian Callahan did come out after the game and say, well, you know, maybe we should have that that split closer between Pollard and Spears. But I don't know, man. Pollard looks like he's back to when he was really explosive from his cowboy days before the tightrope surgery. We now have Pollard 77, Spears 119. They were getting drafted way closer together than that during drafting season. Daigle, thoughts on Tennessee backfield here going forward? Paul ran fewer routes than Spears, but it's as you mentioned, touches are still earned. So to have 70% of the Titans backfield touches out carried him 16 to four plus equity inside the 10, like that's a really strong role. So yeah, we bumped up Pollard. And again, like a lot of people, I was shocked that Callahan essentially lied to us in week one. Maybe he does bounce back and add Pollard more or add Tajay Moore, but again, that's what he said all off season. So I, th- I think Pollard's spot is pretty sweet. Okay. Uh, I want to get to some listener questions now, and then we'll end with our one move to make from each of us. Stay tuned for that. But yes, let's see. Let me pull back up here to the listener questions that we have. We asked for these on Twitter. Hopefully you're following at Establish the Run on Twitter. We will ask for questions, and then we'll pick out some that we answer here each week. Let's start with one from DDCJR the third. He says, I have Jordan Mason in a zero RB build. Do I trade Mason for more long-term value or hold because he offers league winning upside if CMC gets re-injured? The rest of his running back room looks like James Conner, Brian Robinson, Chase Brown. Mark, what do you think about moving on from Jordan Mason now after the big performance on Monday night? In a zero RB build, I think Jordan Mason is is kind of the gold that you're looking for. Honestly, yep. you get to play him week one, and, and it looks like week two. So I, I would lean hold here. And you know, again, I, I mentioned at the top of the show, not necessarily to panic on the CMC stuff, but he does have Achilles tendonitis, and if Jordan Mason starts, he's he's pretty much a locked in RB one. So I, I lean holding on to Jordan Mason unless you think it's just like a gross overpay by someone yeah. in your league to to get him, but. Uh, I mean, we kind of, you already kind of hit the jackpot with Mason at this point. I, I would lean hold and, and enjoy the riches in the zero B build. Yeah. I mean, if someone's going to give me like, I think DeAndre Swift, Najee Harris, Tony Pollard for Jordan Mason, I would take that. I would not take some other, you know, dust ball type thing for uh, Jordan Mason. Um, all right. From non pariah question is on Jalen Hurts. Saquon is, uh, can we not submit questions in emojis? I'm sorry, guys. But anyways, he says, Saquon is arrow up based on reconsidering his opportunities. How much of that comes out of Jalen Hurts's opportunities? So I was literally just looking at this. I have our video team cutting up the three tush pushes that the Eagles run. It crossed my mind, even before the season, it crossed my mind. What if the Eagles aren't as successful with the tush push without Kelsey? I knew they were going to try to run it. But what if they're not as successful and they're like, you know what? Screw it. Let's just start giving the ball to Saquon in these spots instead. And I think that's non prize question here. Jack, thoughts on the Hertz and Barkley dynamic right now? Yeah, I mean, the, the tush push definitely did not look as good as it did, as automatic as it did um, with Jason Kelsey at center. And I, I think that there's a real chance that that affects what they do at the goal line and, and Saquon gets more carries from the one yard line that in previous seasons might have just been Jalen Hurts one yard touchdowns um I I think it's really hard to say though like at this point exactly how much I I think I'm kind of in wait and see mode and and see how the Eagles treat it um which I know isn't a super helpful 
answer, but it, it was such a small sample of tush pushes and the Eagles are a pretty sharp organization that maybe they just still think the tush push is, is the same as it was. And I think there's a good chance that the tush push is kind of close to the same as it was. And it, it was just three plays. Um, but I also think there's a chance that they, they really do start using Saquon more, especially since Saquon is the best running back that they've had next to Hertz. Um, so yeah, I don't really know, but I think it's, I think that's a situation to watch and something that if we don't see the tush push on fourth and one next week, um, then that's a real boost to Saquon's value. Yeah. You know, Saquon is more of like a boom bust runner than a grind it out, get one yard type of runner, right? So like Saquon could certainly fail a lot if they give him the ball on one yard plays consistently. We are up to 13 overall on Saquon right now, down to 28 overall on Jalen Hurts. I, I still think Jalen Hurts can have huge season. I mean, the way they're using the wide receivers, I think is, is really strong. Generally speaking, offense is being good. Saquon making good plays will be good for Jalen Hurts also. So I like where we have Jalen here at 28 overall. Certainly not panicked on him, really, no matter what happens with the tush push. Obviously, ideally, they'll be tush pushing a lot around the goal line. Sleepy Gary says, what about Rico Dowdle? How do you see the situation playing out after week one and the Dalvin Cook call up looming? Well, Daigle. I believe you are a cowboy of sorts. I mean, at least you reside in Texas or resided in Texas at some point in your life. For those guys who don't know, Dakel actually has no home. He just travels from state to <laughs> Might state. Might as well. Yeah, you're right. State to state, uh, living out of a van. But anyways, Dagle, what do you think about the Dowdle-Zeke situation? Currently in our ranks, we are at 112 overall on Zeke, 118 on Dowdle, unranked on Dalvin Cook. I hate that you asked me this question because I wasn't a Dowdle guy coming into the season. Since I stepped back and just look at your profile for what you've done for your career, even dating back to college, and I think it was underdogs Hayden Winks that first pointed out that even going back to high school, Dowdle has only had one season of over 150 plus touches. Not great. The same thing that got us off Zamir White quite easily. So I think it's Ezekiel Elliott still who looked good against Cleveland. Dowdle did not. Plus with Dalvin coming up, it's almost a situation to where you probably get one of them to be an RB3-4 each week, if not a flex. But it's really just runs through Dak. CeeDee Lamb, Brandon Cooks now with Jake Ferguson off the field, perhaps for a limited amount of time. So buying one of the Cowboys running backs, sure, it can be Dowdle. But I, I, I just don't think personally I'm in on that. And I'm trying to remove my biases. So if someone yeah. else has a different take, I'm listening. No, I mean, the, the take is that Zeke can't play anymore. But that did not look, that did not look like... Week one, right? right? It looked like Zeke could still play in week one. And it's so like the bull take on Dowdle was Zeke can't play and Dowdle's going to run circles around him and he's going to get the job. That did not look like it happened in week one. So yeah, I would consider it a pretty bad week one for Rico Dowdle. Let's go to, oh, we haven't talked about Xavier Worthy. It was exciting, man. Now people are going to say Xavier Worthy did not get the volume. However, however, last year, with Rasheed Rice was just balling out every time he was on the field. But the Chiefs still insisted on playing Justin Watson, another dust balls over him. This year, they had other options, but they still gave Xavier Worthy, ran around on 77% of Patrick Mahomes' dropbacks. Now, people keep telling me, oh my God, you should see the replies to my tweet about Xavier Worthy. <laughs> uh, Adam, don't, you don't know that Marquise Brown's coming back? Buddy, I know that Marquise Brown's coming back. I think the three wide receivers set is going to eliminate Justin Watson, and they're going to go with actually their three best players. Is it that crazy? Especially after they let Xavier Worthy right out of the gate with 77%. In other words, three wide receivers set going forward, Rashi Rice, obviously, Xavier Worthy, and Marquise Brown. I do not think Xavier Worthy and Marquise Brown are one or the other. I think they can both be on the field and will be both on the field at the same time. So Fame sees question here is, should I be selling Xavier Worthy? Will his value continue to climb as always it depends what people think but we are at 50 overall on xavier worthy and i like that mark any more thoughts on the xavier worthy stuff i think xavier worthy is going to be awesome rest of the season like i equate this a little bit to the texans passing offense as well we have all three of those wide receivers as like top three to four round values at this point so we could honestly be low on xavier worthy if, if travis kelsey kind of continues to dip in the target share pecking order you know there may be some uneven weeks when he only gets four or five targets and, and doesn't score a touchdown or two but I think there's also going to be some monster weeks with Patrick Mahomes and, and this Kansas City offense 
you know, year over year over year is is top of the league and pass rate over expectation. We know they're going to throw the ball a ton. We we saw them get worthy on that end around, you know, rush attempt as well. Like I, I think he's going to have, I think he's going to get locked into to four or five touches every week. And with his speed and that offense and with Patrick Mahomes, like I, I still think the value is strong on Xavier Worthy. So I would lean hold rather than sell high. Yep, agreed. All right, last question here comes from Billy DFS. He says, Dave Montgomery or DeAndre Swift in full PPR, who do I want for the rest of the season? So Dave Montgomery obviously looked really good. Box score was awesome. DeAndre Swift, I would say, box score was bad, but underlying usage was actually probably better than I thought it would be on DeAndre Swift. Roshan Johnson was a healthy scratch, and Cleo Herbert did not play as much as I thought that he would. So I actually thought it was a pretty clean run out in week one for DeAndre Swift. What was not a clean run out for DeAndre Swift was this idiot Shane Waldron just possibly messing things up for Caleb and this offense all year. I'm certainly concerned about that. We do have David Montgomery ahead of DeAndre Swift in the rankings, not by a ton though. Jack, what do you think about DeMont versus Swift rest of season? Yeah, I'd take DeMont um, as our rankings have it, but I do agree that the box score does not really do Swift justice. I think we thought there was a decent chance that Khalil Herbert would take a good amount of the early down work and the carries, uh, considering he has been a pretty productive runner throughout his career. um, And Swift generally has been below average, Um, but it was all Swift. Uh, Travis Homer was the RB2 over Herbert. So I think if someone's like panicking on Swift, uh, I'd be looking to buy him. But I think Montgomery still, I mean, it's just such a good offense. Um, He's he's never going to get as long as Jameer Gibbs himself, he's never going to get like a workhorse role, but he's, he's still like a pretty good bet to score 10 touchdowns, even sharing the backfield with Gibbs. And if something happens to Gibbs, it's a pretty massive role and right. a truly elite offense. Um, so I think like the upside is higher for Montgomery. Um, but I, I still think Swift is pretty useful. I, I actually don't think this one's close. I'd much rather have Montgomery. I mean, and you talked about it, the contingent upside. If something were to happen to Cleo Herbert or, you know, uh, Roshan or whatever, yeah, it's not that big a deal. Projection on Swift wouldn't change that much. If something were to happen to Jameer Gibbs, Dave Montgomery is going to be an absolute smash. Also, he's in a way better offense with a way better coordinator and all that. So yeah, I, I think it's Dave Montgomery uh, pretty clearly. All right. Let's go to the moment everyone has been waiting for. Each of us are going to give one move to make this week with your teams. Yeah, maybe you don't have this guy on your teams. Nevertheless, Daigle, I'll start with you. If you're ready, what is your one move to make ahead of week two? We're coming out the gates hot, but I'm selling Ramondre Stevenson, who I believe is a game script dependent player. And again, like Zamir White, betting on that, even though he did look amazing, forced the most missed tackles of any running back in the league in week one, but that was also against what we already talked about a, at least in week one, poor Bengals offense who without DJ reader last year off the field allowed 5.1 yards per carry. Silva even called the Patriots winning outright and Stevenson being a good play in DFS in the last minute show that I happened to miss. And I'm still upset about because I needed that second running back spot. So Stevenson. Now, if you just look, at the Patriots schedule coming up, Mike McDonald Seahawks in week two, the Jets defense, the 49ers, the Texans are coming to town, uh, the Jets again, the Titans as well. It just doesn't add up, honestly, to an offense we expect to hang around and build the lead and then give it back to Stevenson. Not only that, but we don't expect Antonio Gibson to play four snaps every week, who was clear questionable coming into the game. He's going to be healthy at some point. So I am in on selling very high right now at peak Stevenson. Mm, yeah, I, 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 that's a good one. If somebody can get someone to buy. I was out on Stevenson before the season. Agree with all the points that Daigle made there for sure. All right, Mark, go ahead with your move to make ahead of week two. I'm going to sneak in one little one, and that's pick up the Chargers defense. They get uh, Panthers this week, but uh, on to the, to the main main event move to make, and that that is going to be sell Jaden Daniels. Um, this one's tough because he had a monster week one and, and pretty much proved to be true. Like what, what we were buying in fantasy and that's his, his rushing ability he finished as the QB three on the week ahead of Anthony Richardson. But 
the guy just has horrendous pass catchers and, and Cliff Kingsbury calling the offense. And I think pretty much all of his fantasy production is going to come in garbage time. I'm a little worried about relying on that as my QB one in fantasy moving forward. And just in that week one, he got two rushing touchdowns, had 20.8 of his 28.3 fantasy points come from the rushing. So I, I think now is a great time to sell high on Jaden Daniels, especially, especially considering how poorly the quarterback position performed overall in week one, like Jaden Daniels sticks out as, as a great producer. We have the Jordan love injury. I think people right now are, are willing to buy quarterbacks. So I'd be selling Jaden Daniels just on the overall outlook of this offense. Um, and, and hope that, you know, he, he doesn't just fully get there in garbage time every week. Yeah. Like that one for sure. Mainly because cliff and, and the weaponry, you know, like you have cliff, and your number two wide receiver is like Luke McCaffrey or Deami Brown. You know, it's going to be rough out there. All right. Jack, your move to make this week. Yeah, I'm going to change mine from what I wrote down. I, I at first wrote down sell Drake London, but he had two catches for 15 yards. So I'm going to shift that. Um, but along the same lines, I'm going to say sell Kyle Pitts um, because he actually had double digit PPR points. Um, whereas London did nothing, but it, it doesn't have anything to do with Pitts or London because they ran around on every single drop back. It has everything to do with Kirk Cousins. I think the fact that he couldn't play under center, the fact that they had zero play action, um, Hayden Winks tweeted that he didn't see Kirk Cousins leave the tackle box. It's the Achilles uh, on his back leg, his plant leg. I think it's all really concerning for Cousins. Um, I mean, I think the the gist of a lot of the guys we've talked about who have fallen in the rankings has been like, I'm worried, but I'm not panicking. Um, I'm c pretty close to panicking, if not all the way there on, on Kirk Cousins. Um, I mean, they like, you could even throw in the, the Penix conspiracy stuff that they signed Kirk, realized um, realized he wasn't the player that they thought, and then, and then drafted Penix eighth overall. I don't, I don't think that's true. I don't think it's, like, the most likely outcome, but I think that there's, like, some chance it's true, so yeah. you have to weigh that as well um Bijan I think I mean his target share is just ridiculous and there's so few true workhorses that I think he's still going to be valuable um but yeah I'm, I'm pretty worried about Cousins and I think Pitts given that he had a touchdown and 11 or 12 PPR points I think he's going to be the easiest to sell so I'm going to say sell Pitts what about the fact that they barely played Penix in the preseason and the insinuation is that they, you don't hold out rookies who aren't going to play all year from the preseason. Like, why would you do that? The insinuation is that they did that because they know Kirk Cousins is in big trouble and they're going to be ready to go to Penix very early here. Someone tweeted me yesterday. I think it might have been Jake Mason who, um, you know, uh, follows all our stuff and takes a bunch of futures. and has some huge hits. He tweeted me that he took 60 to 1 on Michael Penix to be the rookie of the year. Now, hmm. now we're opening our third eye, okay? Now we're opening our third <laughs> eye because if Michael Penix can get in there in, I don't know, week five, week six, week seven, and start slinging it to some really good weapons, then you might be talking, and then you might not want to be selling Kyle Pitts. For now, I kind of agree with Jack. I'm a little scared on Pitts right now with Cousins, but yeah, I don't know. It's a super interesting spot. All right. My move for week two is going to be to double down on a guy that I was big time in on before the season and that is Tank Dell oh Adam he's the third wide receiver oh he, he's not going to be on the field in two wide receiver sets doesn't matter this dude is a straight baller I was a little frustrated with the Texans that they were not positive PROE in week one in fact they were pretty decently negative pass rate over expectation they got to get that up man and I know I keep saying it, and maybe I'm just wish casting it, but I think they, as the season goes on, they will get that up. First down throw rate, three wide receiver set rate, overall throw rate. But regardless, Tank Dell does not need a lot of volume to go off. If he had, there was a ball, I tweeted the video if you want to see it. There was a ball that CJ Stroud, it was a hair underthrown, but Tank Dell was wide open. I mean, he had like two yards on the defensive back. Guy makes a good play to knock it down. If that pass is completed for a touchdown, I mean, everybody's saying Tank Dell is like the best play. I am so, so sure each week that this pass game is going to be productive. Steph Diggs got there with two touchdowns. A lot of his catches were around the line of scrimmage. And obviously, you're not going to be able to get Nico Collins from anyone right now. Dude is a straight baller. So to me, Tank Dell is the one to buy in this offense, considering the box score in week one was not great, even though 
underlying usage was great and he was real close to a big day. All right. That's going to do it for the first rest of season top 150 show of the year. Be sure to check back for the trade calculator in season trade calculator. We'll be doing debuting that later. Also, don't just look at this and step away. We will be updating this stuff for major news as the week goes along in our rest of season top 150. Friday night, myself, Silva, and Wiggins for in-season subscribers on Established Show, talking through every angle of Sunday's main slate. For Mark, for Jack, for Daigle, for the literal dozens of people behind the scenes that it takes to bring you a rest of season top 150 and in-season trade calculator. Sounds insane, I know, but it does. I am Adam. Good luck, everybody.